All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for, for coming out to this session today. Um, look forward to getting to talk with you a little bit during the session and to share with you uh, some thoughts that I've had on a journey of mine just trying to understand more about mathematical modeling and what it could look like in the math classroom. So to start, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Adam Petzl. I taught uh, math at Champaign Central High School, uh, where Randy went many, uh, many years ago. I was not his teacher, though. Uh, <laughs> I taught there for 10 years, uh, all levels of math, and then about seven years ago, I had a chance to uh, transfer over to the University of Illinois and work with pre-service students uh, over the past six, seven years there. And so um, this talk today is just a little bit about my journey, about thinking about modeling and thinking about what it can look like in the classroom. So let me start uh, at the beginning. So around 2010, uh, when the Common Core State Standards came out, I got my first copy and I started reading them. <laughs> And I went through, I had a lot of questions. What is this really going to look like? What's this going to mean? I'm going to quote Sue Pippen over there and say, was this, was this going to be new wheels on an old bus? Or is this going to be a whole new bus altogether? You know, a lot of questions. Read some of the standards. Some made sense. Some didn't. It was hard to get a cohesive picture. So I wasn't sure what to think. And then, you know, I got a little bit excited. Well, well why? Well, the same reason a lot of other, other people did is, is this notion that, okay, it's not just rearranging content standards. It's not just trying to move things around a little bit. We're trying to do things a little bit different and in a way that NCTM have been talking about for years, but maybe now that we've all kind of adopted it, maybe we'll finally see some, some mass movement in the directions of the old process standards, of the reasoning, communication, problem solving. But specifically for me, I mean, there's lots of them here I get excited about, but number four was one that just resonated with me. And I think back, well, why? And I think back, actually, as a new teacher, uh, actually, I was a pre-service teacher, um, and I had my first chance to go to an NCTM conference, and it was in Minnesota. And I was learning about this teaching thing, and I went to one session, that I still remember, and it was a gentleman, I don't remember his name, and he had a TI-83 graphing calculator, and he started putting up all these data sets, and started doing these regressions with his calculator, and bringing up these functions, and then we'd talk about the meaning of the functions in, in, in the problem, and taking out data points, and then thinking about making predictions. And it was like this light bulb went off, as a young, as a young teacher, I thought, well, th this is it. This, this sh finally, I've seen like, a lot of usefulness for all these functions and things I've spent a lot of times in my education just graphing or doing rote things. Like, wow, it's really meaningful. It's related to the real world. It's using the math for some real purposeful questions. I got excited about it, and that kind of began my journey into thinking about just wanting to be a kind of teacher that made these connections in the classroom with the modeling. What also made me excited was to realize, okay, it wasn't just a process standard. It was a content standard. Didn't know exactly what that meant, but it's interesting. <laughs> it was, okay, so it's not just something that we do as a process, but uh, the content, we want to see it in different places in the curriculum. So, so again, it kind of raised the question, what, what's that going, going to look like? So my first question for you for a second is just one of those 30-second turn to your table, turn to your partner for a second or a group of three or whatever. And in your minds, when you think of the word mathematical modeling, you know, what is the first couple things that come to your mind? So take a second, take about a minute, turn to someone or two and just share what, what's on your... So it's always good to start with where we're at as instructors, think about where we're at and where we can build on that. So could I ask a person or two to throw out? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are, there's, a, there's a handout here. And just to note, the handout is very much just a preview. There's a whole lot more that's all available online. Uh, on the handout, there is a website on the very first slide on the bottom. It is a zipped file that will contain every single activity mentioned today is there, along with dozens and dozens more, along with the, 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 the slides and lots of other stuff. So, it's, so just to make a note there that tons of stuff there, get it, it's a zipped file with a lot of, my, a lot of things on there. All right, we kind of hear just one, what's, what, what's one thing your partner talked about? Paul, how about you? Paul, what's one thing that you guys talked about? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a mm -hmm. All right. So definitely, we see some type of real-world connection to mathematics, and, and let's build on that. Let's keep diving in a little bit and taking a look at that. And so, so my journey is just starting there as well. I'm thinking, what does the standards say a little bit? What's the vision for a classroom? What are some things that may look like? What's out there? And so, like I said, this talk is really just sharing with you some of my journey and then sharing some files with you in that zipped folder that I found, and you can do with them what you want. Um, so here's the overall goal. So I want to start for the first little bit of time unpacking uh, the general idea of mathematical modeling a little bit. 
Um, and within that, discussing a little vision for classroom implementation in some different ways that it impacts instruction and learning. And then just looking at some of the things that I found out there to kind of look at it through certain lenses of, well, is this modeling what usefulness would have in a classroom and kind of go through those, those three steps will be the goal for today. So we started looking at definitions of mathematical modeling. I read a whole bunch. And it all comes down basically to things like this. And you can read these two here. The first one um, is from a gentleman named Abrams. Mathematical modeling is the process of using mathematical tools and methods to ask and answer questions about real world situations. And the one from the Common Core, modeling is the process of choosing and using appropriate mathematics and statistics to analyze empirical situations, to understand them better, and to improve decisions. And you get a lot of wording framed around these. But I did notice that in all these definitions, one key word was often the same. Oops. That one. Process. It was interesting. That, that word came up a lot. That the, to mathematical modeling, there was a process that we go through when we do mathematical modeling. And that's where I started honing in a little bit and thinking, that's interesting. So what is that process about? And what does that look like for teachers and students as we're going through that process of mathematical modeling? Well, NCTM in 2000, um, kind of described that process. I thought, I thought they articulated it well. This is from the, the Principles and Standards document. They said, modeling involves identifying and selecting relevant features of a real world situation, representing those features symbolically, analyzing and reasoning about the model, and considering the accuracy and limitations of the model. And if you look at it, there's really four parts of the process as the way they describe it. And it kind of looks like this in my brain. <laughs> so often our students, uh, see the world as two sides. We have the real world we live in, <laughs> every day that we live in and we know how it, we, our experiences are all based upon, upon, these, upon this real world. And then there's a fence separating it from the other side uh, of, the, of this, which is the math world. And, and often we see the two as totally dis disconnected at times, or students see the two as, as one not really serving the other. Yes, exactly. And on that same note, let's come up later, I do think that we do we do math a disservice when we hold up real, we say, let's do a real world problem. And we throw up things that definitely we know in the real world, it's, it's not true, it just doesn't work like that. Or the students see it as a phony and a fake, and it, it just validates the idea of the two sides of the fence here. Now, with that said, I think contexts are good, and sometimes we can say, let's look at it in a context, but to say some things are real world or not is, is a disservice, but we'll talk more about that. But so the idea here is, is with mathematical modeling, I guess it's to link these two worlds together better and see how one does serve the other. And the process kind of just involves starting the real world with that question, so identifying relevant features, simplifying when needed, and jumping into the math world where we think about how the math world describes this real world situation and the tools the math world brings to bear to help with it. And then as we work with it, part of the process is bringing it back into the real world where we see, well, what, what did the math tell us about the real world and does the real world validate what the, what the math told us. What does the math say about the real world? Do we trust that? Are there certain limitations by, based on what the math world told us? And the process involves jumping on both sides of the fence. And that's a big idea um, that I really think I've come away with in reading about this. And we're going to, again, come back to this. But um, I'm actually going to skip this because there's no speakers in here. But Bill McCollum and pa Paul Zimba, is it? I think two of the writers of the Common Core. They have a little short, Jason Zimba, thank you. They, uh, they gave a little short few minute video talking about mathematical modeling, saying some of the things we did. But one of the things Paul Zimba says is he talks about that, uh, you know, when you talk about the business world and the outside world, they realize that when students go out, the problems they encounter in the real world aren't nice textbook problems. That part of mathematical modeling is realizing not, not, not everything is posed in a way where all the givens are there. There's a clear question that we're trying to answer, that there's multiple steps that we go through and that the, the outer community wants to see mathematics helping students get experience with that type of problem solving called modeling of, of encountering those types of messy, messy, he called it messy situations is the way he described it. So again, I, I see that and, and it gets me excited here. So for a second, I'd like you to look at this problem, um, this situation here, and the question is, on a highway that has four lanes headed northbound, there's a traffic jam five miles long. How many vehicles uh, are in that traffic jam. So tell you, why don't you think about it for a second, and if you feel comfortable with someone around you, maybe you don't have to solve it, maybe start talking through how you would think about trying to get an answer for this problem. Let me give you about a minute, think about it. If you feel comfortable and want to talk to someone next to you, feel free. So, so it's interesting, I, I just listened in a little bit to the discussions here and, and heard a lot of good things, just uh, reflecting back some things I heard. I heard people talking about 
Well, maybe I'll focus on one lane instead of four. I heard people talking about, is the traffic moving? Is it moving, and at what pace is it moving? Does that make a difference in the problem as far as the, are the cars actually moving? I heard some people talk about, well, are there trucks or cars here, or motorcycles? Maybe how many of each are there, because that might make a difference. I heard someone talking about how much space is usually between cars in a traffic jam. Well, in, in, that, in that notion here, you see, we started with a question in the real world about how many cars in a traffic jam. And the first thing modeling asks us to do in the process, typically, is to think about what's relevant in the problem, and often having to simplify it. Because the real world can be pretty messy, um, and with a lot, of, a lot of things to consider. And we have to think about, for us, what's important to consider. And we can choose different things here. So maybe, maybe we uh, could Google, what's the, when I did this with students, what's they wanted to Google what's the average length of a car. Great. So they simplified it. They found an average length of a car. Uh, some of them started talking about uh, maybe uh, percentages of trucks versus cars and started to break it down that way a little bit. And then maybe some said, why don't we just average some trucks in or you know, up, up our average a little bit. But they started simplifying it to the situation and maybe assuming it's not moving, you know, let's not worry about movement. Let's just go with five stop lanes, four stop lanes. Well, once they made those decisions, this is kind of a simple model here, but we need to bring math into the question. In this case, really, it's just number sentences and thinking about operations, where I'm going to multiply or divide, and you know, if I, maybe some percents with I'm thinking about the cars, but I'm using some mathematics that are going to model the situation. Um, you know, we then basically compute with that, figure out our answer based on our, our assumptions and our decisions. And then in the end, when we go back, the key thing with modeling is it doesn't, it doesn't end here. So we got an answer. Oh, we did this with students, we got an answer. Some students, I forget the answer. Some students said, oh, it's 5,280. Another group said 6,105. Another group said 4,900. Great, but you know what? It doesn't end here. That's a big idea. We now have to go back up to the real world and say, okay, well, we got different, different, our models gave us different things. Why? Is there one model that we'd argue was a better choice for the model? What are things maybe we're leaving out of our model we'd have to consider? We talk, if we were going to do it again, well, how would we change our first models now to think about after our discussion and maybe get a better idea of what was there? And so it ends back in the real world thinking about the model, about what the, the, the effects of our decisions and what we might want to do differently or what models may have been better fit. And so it's in that process as we, as we go around. So two big takeaways for me on my journey here. So these aren't uh, you know, uh, profound, but simple, but sometimes simple is good. When I think of modeling, I think modeling has to begin with a question in the real world, a clearly posed question, one that hopefully sparks interest, one that, that you know, we are curious about. I, I, the notion of curiosity, to hopefully spark some curiosity, that'd be a good goal, but it's grounded in the real world in a clear question. And then the second thing we just talked about is that modeling doesn't end with the answer in the math world. It has to go with the process when we bring it back to the real world and think about those limitations, the choices we made, the decisions we made, if we would change the model. So two big ideas, I think, as teachers that we, that we bring about here. So the Common Core has a little diagram um, about this process. I don't really like theirs that much, to be honest. Uh, it's OK. But uh, I like Comaps a little better. Uh, Comap, we'll talk about later. It's a, it's a book series that, if you look at the title, is it, the title is these are Modeling Our World series here. Some really interesting resources I'm going to talk about later. But this is a really neat resource if you like modeling. Now, they, they, they chose to go down to four steps. And we figure if it's good enough for Poya, if four steps are good enough for Poya, four steps can be good enough for us here as well. So, so they, they did combine some stuff, and you can argue, but I, I like their model here. And as teachers, we can just think about this. Pretty simple. But that four-step process we did, identify a real-world problem, simplify the situation, you know, build a model and solve the problem in that math world, and bring it back into the real world, evaluating and revising the model to see what we got. Um, and they broke it down for teachers here. So I share this with you. This is in, in the handout, and of course, this will all be made available. But these steps here are nice to think about in terms of the process of modeling as it goes through. And, and they just ask some questions for, for, each, for each step here. But here's some interesting notes. So as I watch some videos and things about modeling, Conrad Wolfram has a talk on uh, TED Talk. And what he's, he points out something very interesting about, interesting about school math and modeling. And he says, often in classes, the most things we ask students to do uh, is this. Is the red part there, if you can read that, solve the problem. So that's often what we, we ask them to do. Often we give the questions, you know, provide, things are already simplified, you know, they kind of solve the problem and give an answer. And he pointed out something interesting, that of all the things up here uh, that technology can do, <laughs> that, we, that we as humans can rely on something else to do, the, the computing often, you know, the computation and the number crunching or using the model, that's actually the part that we have, a lot of technology can do it for us. It's all the other stuff that is really the human element that comes to bear in modeling. 
When I think about the human element, think about the choices I have to make, the decisions I have to make, the simplifications, the choices of the model, the, the talking about the model. That's actually interesting that it's, it's that human element that kind of the exciting part that we want students to be able to get experience with because that's, <laughs> that's the part that, right, at least right now, the machines and computers uh, won't, aren't doing uh, uh, for us. Well, so I read about modeling and I talk about this and, and you know, I, I kind of, I feel like this again. This is awesome, you know, this is a great vision. I want my students in this process. I want to jump in the real world and go through this cycle and debate and it's going to be great. And then I go on a journey and I, I start looking at stuff out there. I search in the web, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to jump in. And I, I look at what's out there. <laughs> a lot of times I kind of feel like this again. Um, like, okay, it's just not quite, what I'm seeing is everything labeled as modeling doesn't always match that vision that's laid out there, those four steps. And it gets me kind of bummed a little bit sometimes. So what does it look like? Well, you see a lot of stuff like this. This is, this is common. And this is even stuff, there's stuff like this on illustrative mathematics and everything. And, it's, and I'm not saying it's bad, but let's take a look at it. Stuff like this is held up as modeling. And it says, like, from these dates, you've got healthcare products, and it gives you uh, this function. We plug in time, and we get sales, I guess. Um, and it says, in what year were about this many health products sold? Yeah, then, then this one, this book even gave a hint. First substitute this, then to, wow, wow. So in that modeling cycle, we can look and think about, okay, what steps did this problem do for us? Well, about, about everything. There's not really even a clear question posed in the beginning to get us interested. I mean, they chose the model. We have no idea where the model came from, why it works. So that, therefore, we can't discuss limitations or choices of the model. And basically, we come down here, we're basically going to, <laughs> plug something in for us and divide both sides by five. So you could strip out everything in the problem of, of words and just turn it into no context and just plug it in and be ready to go. Now, with that said, I'm not going to say that doing some problems like this isn't a bad thing. We, you know, it's good to have scaffolding different types of things. Students can learn in a context. But to say that's modeling, again, then the vision of modeling is not really, it's, it's a piece of it <laughs> because it's using a model, but it's not the whole process of modeling that that, that vision is out there for. So we, see, so we see that a lot, and, and again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying it's bad to use stuff like this, I think it can be good, but the big idea here is I see a lot of things where they have students using a model that's already pre-made and they're just putting stuff in, and that's okay, but, but that's different than being engaged in the full modeling process, definitely, I think we would agree on that. I also get confused because I start reading stuff and I see this a lot, like it says model with mathematics, and then I see uh, you know, pictures of someone using algebra tiles or base 10 blocks and like that to solve math problems, and I get confused because I'm like, wait a minute, this is, they're saying this is modeling with mathematics, but that's totally different than what I was just reading about. And I get there, there's another confusion for me, which is just this is my journey, is I realize there's some clarification for me in what model meant, because there's a lot of different words for model, and it's just one of those words that we use a lot in a lot of ways. And so I realize that sometimes, you know, model as a noun stands for a lot of things. A model is something that, you know, represents something else. So sure, those are models. We have lots of models in math. We can, I mean, graphs tables are models. All those things are, are models. Um, but that's, yeah, that's different than modeling as a verb. Although it's still tricky because over here you could say, you know, she is modeling the multiplication problem with algebra tiles. So the notion of modeling, I think that that word can be a little fuzzy <laughs> at times. But for this talk and the vision, again, we're focusing on the process. And then I realized that some people thought mathematical modeling was this. <laughs> and they were totally wrong. Although maybe that would encourage more people to come into the mathematics community, um, but not mathematical modeling. Um, and then we've got stuff like this. Um, and again, on the face of it, it's a decent problem. It's, it's, if, I know it's too, too small to read, but it's one of those problems where basically you've got a system of equations, linear equations probably. It says you've got baseball jerseys. This one's $21 a jersey. This one's, you've got to pay uh, $45 to get them to make it, you know, the first draft of it, and then $18 for everyone after. You know, so which one should you choose? And like this, this is a modeling problem that's held up off of a certain website we'll talk about later. Um, and it's okay. I mean, there's, again... Students are going to have to think about what, how to describe it with math and, and, and then analyze it and get a question. But when I think about holding up to what Paul Zim, uh, sorry, not Paul, Jason Zimba said in the beginning, you know, he was talking about modeling as these messy real-world situations where you have to make choices and simplifications and it's not all laid out in a textbook. And I realized therein lies the problem because all the curriculum materials, they lie in textbooks. <laughs> so they all look like textbook problems because they're in textbooks. <laughs> so what he's, the vision he's laying out sometimes is hard to see because we, we're, we know it's, it's already formatted and preset in a print media that can be problematic if we're gonna go through the whole cycle, which is, which is interesting. With that said, 
I'm sure we've all done problems like this a lot in class. I love the one, this is an interesting thing here, another question they put out here. They gave a third company that said um, that they, they're trying to set their prices, but how much a setup cost will be and how much each shirt will be. And they asked the students to figure out, this one never wants to be the most expensive, never wants to be the least expensive, so to put a prices in there that will help that. Which again is an interesting application. That's an application thing that's interesting. But I realized here that I would say that sure there's modeling involved here. Does it hold up to the vision that Jason Zimba put out there? And, and they said, well, well, no. So then in my mind, in my journey, I had to kind of make sense of this in my brain. And so here's what I've come up with. This is, this is, this is just something the way I think about it. Because yes, it's modeling, but it's different than what he said. So how does that work? When I think of modeling problems that I see, I think about it, and if I think about it, like placing it somewhere on a, on a two-dimensional scale, I think that first the problem has to have a real-world context. And that context can either lean towards being really contrived are really authentic. And this isn't a, pr I haven't done, I, we have to set, I guess to do this correctly, we have to set parameters of what that means. We're not gonna go that deep right now, but just imagine we can think about it as really contrived or authentic. And on the other scale, um, I'm gonna use Zimba's words of messiness. And some problems are gonna have little simplification and choice, meaning there's not much, it's already kind of a neatly packaged thing or neatly, there's one neatly packaged answer is a very clear model to use. And again, those are still modeling problems but there's just not much choice going on there. And in some, they're gonna have a lot of simplification need and a lot of choice, a lot of decisions to be made and, and those decisions will affect our outcome. And so we can think about, you know, just kind of a simple model of, of some of the problems that we look at when I go through curricula, I, I realize, okay, these are all modeling problems, but sometimes I think kind of where they might fall. And it's not an exact labeling system, but, but it helps me, helps me label a problem, I think. Is that modeling or not? Well, it is, but there's really very little simplification needed. It's a very clear package, you know, or I can think, you know, this one, this one obviously comes right from the real world versus one that you can tell is just very much uh, <laughs> just putting some real world situations on top of an already existing math problem. So up here is what that vision was that's put out, you know, the D <laughs> quadrant. Um, and again, it's not bad to be over here, but just want to point out how I think about that. So with that vision, when you, read, when you read the standards, it says this. It says that choices, assumptions, and approximations are present throughout this cycle. And that teachers should engage students in considering the accuracy and limitations of the model. And those are big. That's different about modeling. These are different kinds of conversations. And this is where you were saying, as a Paul, as a, uh, Fred, I'm sorry, Fred, that, uh, that with students with the ladder and things, like if we're doing problems like that, even that represent a situation or it's a model, to have conversations, not just ignore it, but to say, what assumptions are we making in this problem? You know, obviously we can talk about it. math. Sometimes we simplify the situation, you know, to analyze it in a mathematical way. What kind of things were simplified here? What other things would we have to consider if this was really going to be, you know, uh, to be a, a situation right here in the room in the real world? And let students know it's okay. Because in math, we can get as complicated as we want, but sometimes we start with a more simplified situation to learn about it. And then if we want to get more complicated and add in all those other variables about friction on the floor, angle of the ladder, we can build that in. That's just going to be a more complicated model. And so having those discussions with all of our problems, I think is an important thing we need to add into our conversation as teachers, no matter what it is. Because here's an example. What happens if we don't do things like this, if we don't involve talking about the assumptions? You know, in, in science, they talk about uh, a percentage error a lot, as any lab, percentage error. Where's that in math with our problems sometimes? That same notion. We do some word problems or simple modeling problems. Let's talk about it. So what, do you think this, so we got an answer. Do you think it would hold up in the real world? You know, what kind of assumptions are we making? What do you think? Let's talk about it. So if we don't do this stuff, this is kind of what happens a little bit. All right, so um, I like TI. This is not a knock on TI. It's just an advertisement that, uh, that, that I found here. So look at this classroom. All right. First of all, they're in the Amazon rainforest, which is awesome. I, I, it would be pretty neat to have our class there. And they're doing some activity here. In fact, they're modeling, uh, they're modeling a waterfall, thinking about the distance the water travels um, as it goes down this waterfall back here. And look at the students' faces. What do you see? Smiling. This one's got you know, looking. This one's got her head tilted a little bit. So does she. You know what? They're not smiling about about the math problem they're loving. You know what they're smiling about? They're saying that waterfall goes straight down. Look at that. It goes straight down. And look, we're doing this triangle here. That's total, water doesn't fall like that. They're all laughing. Say water doesn't a right triangle. It doesn't. It curves. It goes down. and goes over the edge. So they're all laughing at that. They're saying math is this is math. Pointless. Silly. <laughs> no good. You know, we can look at that and, and, and realize that, again, we're modeling it with a right triangle. Now, so what do you do with that? It's okay to have this problem, but let's have the conversation. What is this problem assuming about the waterfall? And why is that okay right now? Well, it's okay because we're starting with a more simple model to get it. If we want to get more of an exact answer, what are some things we'd have to consider? If we wanted to build a more complicated model, where would we have to go next? 
You know, and those are questions that we should have and talk about with students to bring in that, that, that real world reality of, of these situations. So with all that said, that kind of sets a little vision a little bit for modeling in my mind of just where I'm on my journey right now. So then I think, okay, algebra class, again, this is where I want to see modeling just driven home. Students jump into algebra class. We want to see real world connections, all these functions in algebra. Man, it would be great to have just lots of connections, students thinking in the real world, applying functions in the real world. It just seems like a rich ground to really oh, just infuse with, with good stuff. And when we think about what that looks like in a classroom, I mean, modeling looks like a lot of things. Definitely, um, students need to be able to create expressions that describe real-world situations and equations and inequalities. We can take existing data sets and think about models that describe those data sets to make predictions or analyze the situation. We can gather our own data to analyze that and use models to think about what we find with our own data when we gather it. We can think about patterns that we see in the real world exist and think about how to generalize it you know, in algebra algebraic terms. We can think about... Um, a big thing in algebra, when you see the park new items coming out, a big thing that they are asking algebra students to do is to justify why one model may be better than another. You know, think about some data and think, is this linear or quadratic or exponential? And be able to justify why one model may be a better choice than another in a situation and, 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 and those types of things. All these things are kind of some rich grounds of thinking about modeling in algebra. So I went on a hunt. I decided, let me go on a hunt and just see what's out there for algebra and see what comes up. So here's my hunt. They went around, I'm going to start with someone that I know you're familiar with. I don't mean to, 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 to uh, just, seems like he gets brought up a lot. But I want to start with one thing him on the modeling hunt here. Um, if you're familiar with Dan Meyer's work, who's going to speak at next year's conference? Did you guys hear that? 2014, he's a keynote speaker, which is, which is awesome. That's going to be really, really neat. I'm looking forward to that. So if you haven't seen his work yet, and most of us probably have at this point, but he, he has got own, his own take on modeling that I feel does come close to going through this process uh, as opposed to some other things, which is interesting. Um, his work basically tries to start with a clear question. Like we said, start with a clear question in the real world that piques curiosity that we can begin with. And he, he's big on media. He says that with modeling especially, our books all have clip art. Our books have you know, things like that. With today's media, man, let's bring the real world in the classroom with video, with pictures. Like That's where modeling can start, with those connections. So... Like here's, for example, if you read this thing here, it says, this is taken from a while ago. It was uh, from the App Store at Apple. And it says uh, the App Store is about to hit 25 billion downloads. And can you read this? It's kind of small. If you download the 25th, 25 billionth app, uh, you could win a $10,000 App Store gift card. Pretty awesome. So, so let's take a look. He's got a little video here, if this works. <laughs> All right. So in his work, he talks about let students, let students practice asking questions. Put it out there. What questions we, could we ask about this? What do you want to know? What are some that come to your mind? Yeah. Exactly. When should I download? And maybe the other ones, too, and encourage students to ask questions. Part of the modeling process is becoming a question asker. And in his work, he really tries to get students to, to take on that role. And then if you ask, you probably have one in your mind as a teacher, so it's one you're probably going to go with. But have them ask a lot of questions. But so here, so we think, okay, well, let's say we want to win that $10,000 gift card. You know, so, so what are we going to need to do to figure out maybe what, what, uh, what, when we should try and download our app? What will be some inf information that you might want to have or, or to, to know? Yeah, sure, you betcha. Yeah, exactly. It would be nice to have that data if we had it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great question, you know, because does it slow down and speed up at times? I mean, time of day, time of year, when you get close to 25 billion, 25 billion app, good questions. <laughs> That's a lot of, my phone was filled up with apps after I had like 20. I'm thinking, I don't know what i do with $10,000 of apps. That's a, I need a bigger phone. Um, yeah, but... Uh, but okay, so, so in his work then, students begin thinking about these things. If you notice what's happening here is we are talking about question. We are talking about some notions of what we might have relevant features of the problem, simplify. And then he, this is, he calls this Act 1. He has a three-act series with his modeling process. In Act 2, uh, basically this is where that information that we want may come to play. But it wasn't just given to students like in the print medium was. It wasn't just say, sitting on the page saying, use me. You know, talk about it. And then there's things as a teacher you can reveal or give out or give all at once. You decide how you want to do it. But he has things on his website like this. For example, he has a video of 16 minutes of data that you might want to use to look at. He has a file, a minute-by-minute -minute count. 
of that data. Um, an image of month or time zone, some things that you could choose to use or not use, really. Again, it's modeling. You have choices. If it's modeling, you have choices. That's one of the big ideas of modeling. And of course, in Act 2, students then use this information in the math world. Now, we've gone into the math world, so we're now doing our thinking about what model is appropriate, how we bring math to the problem, doing our calculations, thinking about it. And then we need to bring it back into the real world. And that's what he calls Act 3, bringing it back into the real world. And when possible, his work is neat because with modeling, if you think, was my model any good? That's a good big question in modeling, right? Was my model any good? Often in textbook problems, well, I guess it was because I got the same answer the back of the book had. That's not really, that's not that vision of modeling. Modeling says, well, tell you what, this is pretty cool. He, he emailed Apple and got the exact day and time when the 25 billionth app was downloaded. And so now we have the real answer. And you know what? I guarantee none of the students' models are going to have that exact time. So now we have that next conversation. Interesting. All right, so where did our models fall short? What kind of other things might we need to consider that we didn't consider to really try and nail this down? We had that conversation, and that's big. He also has something in his, in his modeling, modeling process he calls the sequel, which is great. When problem solving, we always want the next question, right? We do one thing, have that next question up your sleeve. An example here, and what assumptions have you made in your model? Um, talk about, in this one, you can just with a nice linear model if, if you chose, if, you, if, if, your, if your students did it that way. Um, what do the units of slope represent, y-intercept represents? Um, when, according to your model, when did it sell the first app? So just questions, again, to use with your app. But it's that vision he has for modeling in the classroom. Now, one tricky thing I know as a teacher in my reflection on this is, one tricky thing I still struggle with is like, so if say I'm, in, I'm teaching linear functions and algebra, you know, and, and, and we're doing that. And so I bring in this because I know it's, you can really do this well with linear functions. There's definitely other ways you can do it as far as you don't have to write a linear function. You may think of rates or different types of things. And, you, and so, so then you force the linear model. You make them use the model. And my answer will is, is no, not if it's real modeling. But in the end, you're going to make sure that if you're going to dissect different answers and really look at the linear model, that's your focus, make sure that that's you know, brought up and that we understand it. But the notion is that it's nice when students have that choice, that problem-solving element within the classroom. Um, one more real quick just to see his, his vision. If, uh, this is one. A little different, because um, this one's not quite as real-worldly, which, you know, as far as we're on that scale, uh, it would be uh, a little different. might take a second or a few more and you know maybe this is where again if the students ask questions where are some questions you might ask give me a couple think of you, can you think of a couple questions you might ask okay one's how many pennies what's the radius at large circle why are they doing it yeah I definitely let the questions fly because that's an issue it is, it is why not use quarters yeah or well, how, what's the difference we did use quarters you know, how much less would that be? But how much more money would it cost? Would it cost more money? I wonder, you know, the money ratio of quarters versus pennies. How, much, how long would it take? A lot of questions we, we could answer. Of course, we'll choose one. Maybe we have one in mind, we'll, but we'll, we'll go with that. But again, you go to Act 2, and, and there's different types of modeling here. In this case, uh, he recommends having students gather some data. He has some circles, give them some pennies, whatever. They can make some data here, fill them up, gather some data, think about it, think about the patterns, the situations, the model that might be used. Again, as students, hopefully they'll ask for, like you did, sir, that the radius or things like that information that can be revealed when asked for, <laughs> not just on the page. And then, of course, uh, when we go to Act 3, oops, when we go to Act 3, I'm not going to play it right now, but there's a video of him putting it out. And well, I guess I'll just start it here. Just so you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't keep it. Uh, oh. There it is. Um, with the videos, if you're wondering if he actually plays out the whole video, he, he'll, he'll use fast forward to <laughs> go through a lot of it so that you don't have to sit and watch actually the whole, whole thing. Um, but so you go around and get the idea. But here's the big idea again is with this type of modeling vision, when students get to the end, well, again, how'd we do? <laughs> Which model was the closest? Why? What maybe things did, should we have considered in our model? How would we change our model now that we've seen it? Is there a reason, you know, here maybe, you know, there are things about the situation with the pennies that, that are different than we thought now that we see it, about maybe gaps or different types of things. You know, we just have just going back and thinking about the model here. And, and again, like I said, there's more, 
more sequel questions. You can flip the question, 2,000 pennies, how big of a circle would that fill? Um, that type of thing's going back and forth. And on his website, uh, again, there's this, he has a site here and there's links on the, on the handout I gave you, I want to point out, on the back page of the handout I gave you. So as I've been looking at his stuff, I tried to organize it in the back as far as if you were teaching algebra, what lessons kind of fit in different areas, you know, as far as that. So if you go in the back and think, okay, I'm doing some linear function work, I gave you a list of problems that he has that, that basically go for linear modding, because I think that's what I was missing on his site. I was like, where do I start? So I did some work for you. That was my journey. I'm sharing that with you. This, these are ones I thought I would use in these situations in a class that would lend themselves well to those situations. Quadratic, exponential, square root. Not all of them are three-act models like that, but they all involve video or pictures that bring in a real-world component that students have to ask questions and, and analyze with the work there. Um, some of them actually have students gather their own data, like number four, air travel. It's interesting. You had students get online and, and Google from an airport miles and cost and time to do different things, and they tried to write some models to figure out things about airplanes based on that. But that's all on that sheet there. Um, so, and that's in, on the zip file, so you can link directly from there on the zip file. All right, the second thing um, I want to share real quick is, so Dan Meyer has got one vision that's pretty exciting in my mind because it matches that, pro that's, that, that process we're looking for a little more. A lot, of, a lot of people talk about this map site. If you go to sessions, you'll hear this a lot because it's another great resource site for, for Common Core links type stuff and some good tasks and assessments. So it's a good resource here. And they claim to have a lot of stuff on modeling. But I noticed that it looks different on each site. It, places I went, it looked different. You know, the modeling did look different. So on this site here, um, uh, first they, well, so the, well this group, um, I'm going to skip this so you can read that. <laughs> it's, it's, so. Basically, this is where this problem came from, the t-shirt problem. This is what it kind of looks like on their site. Now, their site offers things that are a little more like what you'd find in, you know, a page you print out, which is helpful, which is helpful. You know, having things on paper you print out. But we see, again, that it was a little more, didn't have as much simplification needed or choice, which is still okay. Some of the questions here are really good. Sometimes they weren't quite as authentic. You know, there wasn't that real-world connection. We saw things like this, which is, you know, this is a pattern problem. It's interesting. There's lots of growing patterns for algebra. Uh, basically, they're having students think about how many cubes to build the next layers and how many to build the nth layer, different questions. And, and that involves some modeling because we're looking at a situation. Again, it's, it's a little different from Dan Meyer's in the sense that we see the authentic versus contrived a little bit situation there going back and forth. There's not a lot of simplification needed. There is some choice in models. So we're choosing, again, it doesn't say like use a linear model, it doesn't say use a quad. So I like that it's offering choice of a model. But as we see just comparing and contrasting some of the differences we see. And again, all this stuff is in that zipped file uh, online, all ready for you to go organized in nice folders. Um, and there's some stuff like this, which I wasn't quite as excited about, but I thought about it. There's problems like this that, that um, talks about your guitar teacher and uh, basically, or someone is, and trying to make a profit, and it gives you a bunch of things and wants you to write an equation and do a graph here. And there's, some, again, some good stuff here. But then I think of the modeling process. Again, they've, they've identified all the key variables. They've, they've identified all the simplification for you. All that work's been done, and now you're just using their stuff to do it. So why not think about the processing cycle and change it a little bit? For example, just start with a clear question, right? Go back to the real world and start with a clear question. Suppose, suppose a guitar teacher is trying to make money by giving lessons in a rented room at a local music store. What would he need to consider if he wants to make a profit? Boom, just stop. Let's start there. Let's get a list on the board of all the things you might want to consider. That'd be important here. Some will be good, some will be off the wall. That's fine, make a list of things on the board. But we're identifying what, and then, and then to think about the situation, we're going to have to simplify it. Let's choose ones that are probably the most relevant. And as a teacher, sometimes I may have to help with that process to know where I'm going. But, but then let's choose, let's choose number of students. Let's choose cost, cost of the rented room. Let's choose how long he gives lessons a day or that type of stuff. Let's give those a variable. And now I wonder if we were going to write a, an equation that would model this profit situation to determine based on, based on if we had numbers for these things, you know, what would that be? We can start building you know, a model based on those. But I think the difference is, just depends from everything on a worksheet to a little more classroom dialogue, is that we want to get students involved in thinking about all those variables and, and choices that we make along the way. So think about that. And they have some nice problems. Again, nice stuff up here. I like it. So they, they just, just show you what it looks like in here. They have things, drinking cans, trying to minimize the amount of aluminum for a certain volume. You know, good things. Uh, lots of good, good rich problems here. Um, but you can see some, some differences of modeling between Dan Myers and this stuff. I also like on their site that they tell teachers, if you're thinking about doing modeling in a classroom, here's some good things to do. They actually have a whole bunch of good problem-solving questions that I love. Uh, they're in the zipped file. Uh, there's a whole bunch of But they talk about this. Simple things. It's not profound, but it's good to think about. Introduce the problem and give time, people time to think. <laughs> Collect ideas on the board. 
students and work on the problem. And then maybe in the middle of it, the whole class will have to discuss a little bit, but then send them back out on the problem again. <laughs> and then come back together and report our reasoning. You know, very simple, but that's what, what modeling might look like in a classroom for some of these. And you don't have to come back together, but sometimes with modeling, again, if you have groups that are making progress and others that aren't, it's okay to come together and have people share some thoughts and ideas or ways they're moving to help scaffold and get groups moving, but then set them free again, you know, and come back together um, with, that, with that sharing at the end. They also talk about on their site, um, introducing a problem, working in collaborative small groups, and making posters of their models so that po groups make a poster describing their decisions and their models on a poster that they can bring up and have a discussion with the classroom. And on the work, I'm not going to go into this now, but on the, on the problems on Mars, this, this, this website, is they have samples of student work that are written in a way that you're supposed to give to your students to look at and analyze, which is an interesting part of modeling. I thought this was unique. They say, give your students the student work and ask them to critique the model. Ask them to think about, was this a good choice or not, or was it correct or not? That's an interesting piece of modeling, critiquing others' models um, for practice standard three. Very interesting. Um, all right, and that brings me to my third journeying here, and the last main one here. So we had Dan Meyer, we had that Mars website, and then these Comat books. Have you, has anyone ever heard of these before? Several of you, okay. Um, interesting resource, the Modeling Our World books here. You may consider investing in a, in a set for your, for your department. Um, all right, and so their stuff looks like this. So I'm going to show you a few things here. In the beginning, we talked about modeling as sometimes starting with data sets or collecting data. Comap does a really good job of providing very good data sets to begin modeling with. They're often, often housed in pretty good authentic situations. I know you can't read this, it's small, but this is about manatees, and they have powerboats, uh, licensed powerboats in this lake region, and the number of manatees killed in a yearly cycle based on the number of powerboats that were there. And so it sets it up here, but within that circle, it asks them to do things about, one, they're going to have to present a convincing argument to the public. So it starts with a goal here. We're going to use a convincing argument to the public. We think as well that we're going to have to find a model that describes the relationship. It doesn't tell them what model. And we're going to have to show the model, show, show or prove your model does a good job describing the situation and make a prediction based on it. But it, they have these rich data sets here um, on COMAP. We see as well, um, they have these projects here, which are interesting, that if we want students in the modeling process, things that are less scaffolded versus more highly scaffolded, there's things like this. Let me share this with you. They have projects like this where they tell students that they're anthropologists, and they give students lengths of some mysterious bones they found uh, for femurs and, and different types of bones here for two skeletons. And the students are supposed to try and figure out if this was a male or female and how tall they might have been in real life. Well, how do you do that? Well, basically with this, with previously collected data that we already have going through. And we have a lot of data here to, 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 to start with. And students then have to take the data and think about, what do I do with it? How do we start comparing relationships, trying to look for patterns, look for models that will help me decide and make a decision about male or female and height based on different bones? Very interesting, very, very open, uh, very neat opportunity to get some good debate going. But then you have to say, well, oh my gosh, that's a lot of data, <laughs> right? What do students do with all that? Well, that's where this comes in, right? It, modeling also opens the door for some technology meaningful. Because if you're going to get real world data sets like that, you're not going to do it by hand. That's going to be crazy, and uh, that's not what you want to go. The standards specifically say modeling opens up the door for certain technologies. Um, so basically, with, with GeoGebra, I actually had this in GeoGebra, but I don't want, I'm running out of time to open it. But, the, um, but I, have, I have directions for you um, in the zipped folder. Um, one is a set for how to do things like this on GeoGebra, how to enter in data and, and use it to analyze data and make predictions. What I like as a teacher is if I entered in the data myself, or how do my, better yet, how do my students do it during, a, during an off period, then I can just share that file with my students, set to go, we don't waste time typing it in. But now we can jump in on the real work, analyzing and modeling that data. And the TI-84, if you're using those, uh, just so you know there's a nice, uh, and you can share those data as well with the cable and things, but there's a direction sheet in there. Um, and so there are projects out there on, on the site. Um, one more, one last one from Comet I wanted to share is imagine things like this. It's getting a vision, and, and these are all on that zip file. In this project, you'll you're going to design a stunt for a Western movie in which the hero falls off a rooftop onto the roof of a stagecoach being drawn by a team of horses. <laughs> in order to make your plans, you'll need to choose the height of the building, the speed of the stagecoach, and the dimensions of the stagecoach. Make sure your choices are as realistic as possible. Interesting. So that's different. That's different than you know, just more scaffolded problem. We have choices here, a lot of things. We think about, hopefully, with the type of gravity formula, we we'll have to use something there. But 
there's a lot of choices here we're going to make and then convince that our model works for a situation. That's, that's, that's definitely a full process. You can imagine that going through that full modeling process and debating back and forth. Yes, Kathleen? What happened to your arm? My arm? Um, <laughs> I jumped. I, was, I, was trying, I worked with my students on this, and we were seeing if their model was right. So, so I got to the top of the building. We drove a car at the speed they predicted, and I jumped, trusting my students. And I should have checked their work, because I missed the car, landed on my arm, and, and broke my hand. Yeah. All right. So. So, no, yeah. So I guess the last things in, in conclusion here, wrap is, is remember this, that this is, not, many of you probably do this already in your classrooms as far as collecting some data. When you think of modeling, think about collecting our own data as well. There's lots of questions out there. I know in an algebra class, I did this one, that was fun. We talked about how long would it take for a fan wave to go around Soldier Field in Chicago. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, wave going around the whole building. How long would that, would that take? So we did some modeling, we did some simulations in class, students did up, we did the wave, we took some data, we measured, we put it up, you know, and, and, and then, and then um, um, now I didn't have at the time, I wonder now if there's, again, a YouTube video or something where we could see a fan wave go around and have an actual, you know, again, check, that would be neat. Uh, maybe it's out there. But you get things, you know, all sorts of questions that, that we can do from experimental to just questions where students can gather data. Um, and one, one, how many of you have ever done the cricket lesson with chirps and temperature? It's kind of a classic. It's, it's out there. I mean, so you get data where, where, based on the temperature, crickets chirp a certain degree, and there's a relationship. But there's a teacher named Jason Deal at Champaign Central who took this to another level. I love it. This was a great idea. So he said, instead of giving the students a table of the data already set with, with it, he basically made sound files. And, and he let me share. These are all in the file, zip file. And so he had the students gather the data themselves. They were researchers. He played the audio in his classroom. And he said, this is 54 degrees. Make sure you listen. <laughs> so they were listening. I got, I, got, I got 12 chirps. No, I had 14. I, got, I, I, got, I heard 13 chirps. But they gathered the data themselves with the chirps. They were, they were fake sound files, but, but they were, they're good. They're crickets. They, you know, but they gathered the data, and then with the data they gathered in a kind of that fake way, it was just different. It was a different. They were part of the process. It was interesting. They felt like they were part of the gathering, part of the modeling process in a different way. But that was unique, and that's been shared up there as well. And there are other things as well. And, uh, and on the assessments, there are modeling problems on the assessments. Not, much, not too much has been released yet for, for a lot of examples at this point, but there are two. This was called a prototype item uh, for Park, uh, And the prototype item, you can see here they gave a situation with rabbits. There was a, 10 rabbits are put into an enclosed wildlife ranch, and the rabbit population triples for the next five years, as shown in the table. And here students have to basically drag and drop in a model. So you can kind of see, again, they're choosing a model. They have to think about what would fit the data. You can see what we might be asked to do on a park assessment. Uh, the, here, there, the same problem, part B. Uh, they change it a little bit and ask students to select all that apply and think about, uh, it's a little different situation. They doubled each year. And so it asks students to think if the model changed, if the situation changed, how would your model change? So that's the kind of questions that Park is leaning towards, again, and on the assessments. And then a little more open-ended, they're comparing the two um, one that just came out more recently was actual sample item. So a sample item, this is one that actually saying this could be a real item. The prototype was more of just a maybe item. This is more, this could be real. Here, this is an example of what students might be expected to do based on some algebra work. Is they have a, a table based on cooling for a, uh, I forget what it is here, was it a drink or something? Material that's cooling over time. And you get the black data points. And they drew in three possible models for you and identified which is model, which is quadratic, which is exponential ask you to verify which model you think is the best and justify your reasoning um, of the model. Um, explain why other models are not as good of a choice. And then there's another question where they use the, the one they chose to make some predictions and things. But you see, again, that's what it's looking like. So it's, it's not just plug and chug. It all is choosing a choice, thinking about the model, why I choose that model, how do I use that model as we go through that. Um, and so I want to pause there for a second before I close. And maybe maybe time to, to, to take questions or for you to share. Maybe you have a vision in your classroom um, that you use modeling a certain way or you have a favorite project that you think of that you do that just, you know, that you've seen it come to fruition in your classroom in a certain way. So let me pause for a second and, and stop there. Questions or anyone willing to share an example? Yes. So a couple things with that. Number one is, as teachers, we need to be modelers ourselves. We need to do the same work. So if we've never done modeling like this or thought about these choices, number one, I think we have to start there. We need to put ourselves in some professional learning circles where we take some of these same problems, 
that we're going to give our students and say, well, let's do it ourselves. Let's model ourselves. Let's see how we think about it. And let's do it ourselves first and put ourselves in those same shoes and reflect as teachers. What kind of questions could we ask students? Yeah. And then I like the idea, you said, if, of getting each other's classrooms. You know, when we have a lesson that we're planning together, we one that we're, we're ha excited about. If we can find a way to, to see it, to view it, to have a chance to share these together, someone that's really excited to try it out, I mean, making it, making it a collaborative process. I know it's hard with the timelines that we have in class, but that's a big thing to share and not feel like you're doing it alone. Yeah. Yes? And you know what I believe? I believe that, back to that fence model or, or seeing the four steps, I believe we share that with our students. I don't believe we leave that hidden behind the scenes. I think if we're doing modeling, I think we let them be part of the process and see the process to realize exactly what you said. All of this is mathematics. This is all part of what we do as mathematicians and analyzing the world with mathematics. And let them, again, see that and talk about it. And if we want to use the, the jumping over the fence analogy or whatever works with your students, but I think that we want them to see mathematics as a broader picture there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fred, that's a great question. You know what? I believe to choose to be optimistic. I believe it's a, it's a choice I'm going to make. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try as a, to keep optimistic to, to the whole notion of, of who knows where one of these students who maybe catches a vision, gets a big idea, where they go off to, and, and who knows. But, I, but yes, I'm going to stay optimistic and say, let's keep moving in this direction. Let's keep moving for change. Let's keep, and it's not a new idea. Right? It's not a new idea. Modeling is not like the Common Core came out like, oh, modeling with mathematics. This is a brand new idea. No, I mean, this this is what we do with mathematics since the beginning of time. We're just getting the emphasis on it and thinking what it looks like today's technologies and some of the media uses and connections to the real world. There are some unique opportunities now, I believe, that are different now than were before to bring in some real world into the classroom. But, yes. So, but, here, but here's the opportunity. The opportunity is that right now in the standards, it says modeling as a content standard, modeling as a process standard. There's an opportunity right now to, for the higher ups to see this is what it says. This is what we need to do to go back to the standards. It's not just me. This is what 46 states are all moving towards. And this is the vision. Here's what the writers of the Common Core said. This is what we want. So there's a unique time to try and help sell that right now, saying it's not just me. It's not that this is what we want as a whole, I'm moving for that. But I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's, it's not. But I do see... see a chance to use that. One second. I want to do one thing real quick. Again, on the just to show you on that on that zipped file, just to just to show you what's just to explain one thing with that. Um, so if you go in that zipped file, it pretty much is is this. And I know it's let me see if I can uh, I need a finger. <laughs> oh. oh I was trying to zoom in but Oh, sorry. My typing skills have dramatically decreased over the past couple of weeks. Dramatically? I say dramatically. That's a good word. Anyway, well, I know it's hard to see, but just to show that up here there's some of those examples from, from the Dan Meyer links, from the Mars task, illustrative mathematics, some various regression tools and, and problems. So if you're just looking for a place to start, here's a good resource to get started. Find some things that maybe interest you or pique your interest, and some of them are organized by, by function type where it might fit in. It could be a good place to start. So that's, I know we're at time here. If you have more questions, I'd be glad to individually talk with you. But thank you so much for coming. And, um, and uh, fight the good fight. All right. Teach.